Welcome back. Remember last time we ended with my theory that Tutankhamun was murdered? And he was succeeded by I, the vizier, the old vizier, who may have been the murderer. What I want to do in the beginning of this lecture is trace for you the pharaohs from Tutankhamun up to Ramses the Great, about whom we'll be talking today. Now, you remember that I was an old man, and he only reigns for two years. And we have an unusual circumstance in Egypt now. We have two pharaohs in a row who have left no children. Tutankhamun had no children, and I has no children. There are no royal people alive, and the question becomes, who will be the next king? How do you decide it? The answer is by power. The next king is a man named Horemheb, who's a commoner. He must be a commoner, there's no royals alive. And he's the general, so he seizes power. He has the army behind him, and he can become king of Egypt. Now, he does a very interesting thing. He attempts to erase all traces of Akhenaten's heresy, when Akhenaten changed the religion to monotheism, brushed all the other gods aside, Horemheb erases every trace of that. Now, he does several things. I mean, he does it in many ways. He goes to Amarna, the city that Akhenaten had built, and tears it down. Just rips it to pieces and he reuses the blocks inside his own monuments. He also erases all traces of I, his successor. So we've got Tutankhamun and I and Akhenaten, all who are inside this sort of Amarna heresy. He even erases Tutankhamun's traces. So we've got three kings who will not appear on any of the official lists of the kings of Egypt just because they're tainted by this monotheism, the heresy. Akhenaten's the first one, then his son Tutankhamun, then the successor I. They appear on no lists at all. And Horemheb becomes king of Egypt, a commoner. Now, Horemheb reigns for quite a while. And he dates his reign from the first year of Akhenaten's reign. In other words, when a king comes in, that starts the calendar anew. So the first year of Ramses the Great will be year one of Ramses the Great, and then year two, year three. Horemheb comes in and puts his date way back to where Akhenaten reigned. In other words, he's saying they never existed. He wipes them out from history. But he is a commoner. Now, he also has no children. We have three kings in a row with no children, and the question becomes again, who will succeed him? How do you do it? The answer is Horemheb seems to pick his successor, and he chooses someone whom at first might seem unlikely, an old man. His name is Ramses. He was a military man, and then eventually served sort of as Horemheb's vizier. He's an old man. Why pick him? The answer is Ramses has children and grandchildren. The succession will be established. You're not going to have this problem of a pharaoh with no kids. You, you've gone three in a row, Tutankhamun, I, Horemheb, with no kids. This is going to end. So he chooses his successor, Ramses, an old man who has a son named Seti. And that son has a son who is going to be Ramses the Great. So we have these successions. It's an unusual time for Egypt. Egypt's a little bit tottering. Who's the legitimate pharaoh? But it's going to be on track again with Ramses II. You'll see. Now, officially, Horemheb is the last king of the 18th dynasty. This is artificial. It's the way Egyptologists keep track. The Egyptians never kept track that way. They never thought in terms of dynasties. They sort of saw it as all one legitimate list of gods succeeding each other. But Horemheb, we say, is the last king of the 18th dynasty. And we say that Ramses I, this old man whom he chooses as successor, is the first king of dynasty 19. Technically, Horemheb doesn't belong to either dynasty. He really has no blood connection to either one. But dynasty 19 starts with Ramses I. Right? And as I say, he has a son, Seti I, and he has a son who's our subject for today, who becomes Ramses the Great. Now, you can imagine that right off the bat, Ramses was being groomed to be Pharaoh. As a little kid, they knew he was it. Right? So he grows up knowing he's going to be Pharaoh, and he has a special training, and we'll talk about that. Now, Ramses rules. Ramses the Great. There's only one Ramses the Great. There are 11 kings named Ramses. There's only one Ramses the Great, the second. 
Ramsey's rules for 67 years. A very long time. For most of Egypt, he was the only pharaoh they ever knew. Right? For most of Egypt. And it starts out rather boldly right from the beginning. His father, Seti, took young Ramses on military expeditions when he was a kid so that Ramses would get used to battle, get used to chariots, the army. So he is being trained as a military man right from the beginning. Now, Ramses takes five names. Every pharaoh, every pharaoh had five names. And you could pick them. It wasn't like mama gave them to you. They were indicative of sort of the political times usually and what your aspirations were. And let me tell you about Ramses' five names. Right? Now, every pharaoh had what they called a Horus name. And that name associated the king with the falcon god Horus. Because remember, the pharaoh is Horus on earth. Remember way back to the Narmer palette? And we had a falcon who was holding the, the captive through the nose by a ring? That's the pharaoh. So there's a Horus name. And Ramses' Horus name is Horus Strong Bull, Beloved of Truth. So he's Strong Bull. A powerful name. Now, the pharaoh's next name is called the two ladies name. Two ladies. And this refers to very early goddesses, the cobra and the vulture. These were always protective deities. And if you look at the gold mask of Tutankhamun, on his brow is a vulture and a cobra, the sign of these two ladies. So every pharaoh wanted to associate himself with these two ladies. And Ramsey's name, his two ladies' name is Protector of Egypt Who Subdues Foreign Lands. Again, clearly a statement. This guy is going to subdue foreign lands. Military, right from the beginning. Another name is called the Golden Horus name. And it's associated with a falcon of gold. Ramsey's Golden Horus name, rich in years, great in victories. And it was true. Ramses was going to have many years. He would die at the age of 86, and he'd have many victories. So it was almost precognitive. Next, the last two names are the only names that a pharaoh wrote in a cartouche, in that oval, encircling his name. And one of the names is his King of Upper and Lower Egypt name, where it says, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, and then his name is Strong in Right is Ray. Right? So it's strong in right is Ray. So the, the sun god Ray is strong in right. right. Get a power, power, power. And his last name, which is called his son of Ray name, is beloved of Amun. Right? So he's Ramses, beloved of Amun. He's looking for the god's protection. So Ramses has some pretty powerful names. And right from the beginning, he's making a declaration. I'm going to be a warrior. The name Ramses, by the way, is an interesting one. It's the sun god Ra, Ra. And after it comes Messus, Ramesses, which means birth. So it means Ra is born. Right? You get a lot of names with Messus at the end. Tuthmosis, the god Toth is born. Iamosis, the moon god Ia is born. So Moses always means is born. And Ramses is Ra is born. So he's got powerful names right from the beginning. Now, Ramses is going to distinguish himself in two ways. First, as a military man, and next, as a builder. Right? Now, one of the things that happens for Ramses very early in his reign is he completes his father's buildings. Every pharaoh died before completing everything. And Ramses completes Seti I's temple at Abydos. Abydos was a sacred city. It was a city where it was believed that the god of the dead, Osiris, was buried. So everybody wanted to build something at Abydos. Seti built a temple, but he died before it was completed. Now, the temple's unusual. Almost every Egyptian temple is dedicated to one god. This temple is dedicated to many gods, so it has many doorways. And Ramses does a, a curious thing. He finishes his father's temple by bricking up most of the doorways, puts stones, filling them up for one reason. He wants more surface area so he can carve things about himself. He is going to complete his father's monument, and he's going to boast about it. He's going to say, it is a good son who completes his father's monuments. And then he puts his name all over it.
right? So that's going to be a sign of Ramses to come. He's got the ego. Ramses is eventually going to become, well, he's called by modern Egyptologists the great chiseler because he was famous for chiseling off people's names off of monuments and putting his own. But he completes his father's monument at Abydos and puts his name all over it. There's one other monument he completes for his father. It's at the great, great temple of Karnak, which is in Thebes. And it was sort of, Karnak was like the Vatican of ancient Egypt, a vast, sprawling temple. It was, it was really built over a period of 2,000 years, with each pharaoh adding a different temple or a chapel. So it kind of like Topsy, it just growed, and it doesn't have much of an organizational plan, but it's huge. And Seti I, Ramsey's father, built one of the greatest parts of that temple, the Hypostyle Hall. It's huge columns, 108 fabulous columns. Ramses completes it, and you guessed it. He puts his name all over the columns. You hardly find Seti, you'll find Ramses the Great. So Ramses completes his father's monuments, putting his name there, we get an idea of his ego. And then we get Ramses as the military man, very early in his career. Year five, he's about 25 years old maybe, right? Becomes Pharaoh when he's perhaps 20. In year five, Ramses is going to fight a battle that he will boast about for the rest of his life. It is the battle about which we have more information than any other event in ancient history. There are more accounts of this battle than any other ancient event. I can tell you incredible details about this battle. I can tell you the names of the horses. <laughs> it's that detailed. And Ramses will boast about this battle for another 60 years. Now, what is it? What is Kadesh? Kadesh is a city in Syria north. And it had been growing independent. Egypt always kept it under its thumb. But now the Hittites, that's where Turkey is today, the Hittites are controlling it. And Ramses doesn't like this. So in year five of his reign, Ramses marshals the army and he rides out to retake Kadesh. Now, what I would like you to get a feeling of today through Ramses is what military life was like in ancient Egypt. The army was organized in terms of not rank really, but sort of skills. The lowest down were the infantry. These were the guys who had a sword, a spear, and a shield. And they walked. You were going to go to Syria in battle? You walked from Egypt to Syria. 15 miles a day, roughly, and that's how an army moved. Slightly above the infantry, were the archers. These are kind of skilled men. They have a little bit of an advantage because they can enter into battle without being in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They can stay back a ways. The bow, by the way, is an interesting weapon. It's the first weapon to store energy. That is, when you bend it, the energy is stored in the string in terms of, you know, and then it's released. So it stores energy. It gives you an advantage. So you had your archery, and then you had the chariotry. These were the guys who rode on the chariots. Now, chariots were the tanks of ancient Egypt, or really more like the jet, jet planes even. They were the elite. Chariots were very, very expensive to build. If you think about it, it took three kinds of wood to build a chariot. You had to have a very strong axle. You had to have wood that would bend for the wheels, right? And you had to have light wood for the body so it could move easily. So you have three, three different kinds of wood, very, very skilled. They're very light drawn by two horses, two men on the chariot, right? an archer, and the charioteer who's driving the team of two. Right? And then the problem is, how do you shoot an arrow from this bumpy thing, you know, which doesn't have a suspension? Um, the answer is, the floor of the chariot was woven. So it's kind of like a trampoline almost. It kind of evens out the bumps a little so the archer isn't going crazy trying to shoot his arrow. So these were the elite. So you had your infantry, your archers, your chariot, and Ramses marches out with these guys. Now, how many people does he take with him? Ramses takes an army of 20,000 divided into four divisions. Each division is named after a god, right? So there's the division of Amun, the division of Re, the division of Ptah, and the division of the god Set, named after like Seti's father, sort of. So you've got four divisions of 5,000 men each, and they go to Kadesh. Moving north, 
no problem for this army. Every town they go through, they simply do what they want. This is an incredible army of 20,000. There are logistical problems, by the way, with 20,000 men moving in the ancient world. How do you feed them? You can't stop at a village of 4,000 and say, feed my 20,000 men. You have to plan ahead. I mean, even, for example, think about it. If your pack animal is the donkey, a donkey can only take enough food on its back for itself and its rider for three days. Then it runs out. You can't pack enough food. So they had to go where there was food. They're figuring out what time of year, when is the harvest, where do they have... And they had storehouses along the way. So you could pick up stores. So there was a real logistical problem here to figure out how to get there, but they get there. And Ramses, as he's entering Syria, right, they go through the Becca Valley. Now, I think this must have been an amazing experience for the average Egyptian infantryman, say, the, the, the lower down. These guys never left Egypt except for in battle. They would see flowers for the first time. They're seeing wildflowers. In the distance, in Lebanon, they could see snow on a mountain. This was really quite something for these guys. This was, it was like World War II soldiers going abroad and for the first time seeing Europe, seeing these things. This was an experience they would never forget. So they're en entering the Becca Valley. And as they're entering, Ramses meets up with two locals. And they're trying to get information out of the locals. And they say, where are the Hittites? Right? Now, the Hittites are led by Mutwallis. Right? He is the Hittite king, and he is leading the army. And the locals say, Mutwallis heard you were coming with 20,000 men, and he fled north. He's 100 miles away. Now, Ramses is 25 years old. He's young, inexperienced as leading the army, and he believes them. Sounds right to him. I'm Ramses the Great. I've got an army. They ran away. They're scared. It was a lie. These guys were plants. Mutwallis was hiding in the woods, not far from Kadesh, with 40,000 men and 2,500 chariots. He was waiting for Ramses in ambush. But Ramses, of course, has swallowed the hook. And Ramses says to the rest of his army, I will go on ahead to Kadesh and establish camp. You bring up the rear. So Ramses goes on ahead. As Ramses moves to Kadesh, one of his divisions of 5,000 men is attacked by some of the Hittites. Ramses doesn't know this, and he sets up camp at Kadesh. Now, we have pictures, not exactly photographs, but on temple walls, Ramses carved exactly what his camp looked like. We get a, we get a scene of the camp, and the camp is made up of an enclosure of shields, Egyptian shields, they were always the same shape. You can always tell in the, in the battle scenes, the good guys and the bad guys, by the Egyptian shields. They're round top, like a, they look like a tombstone. And they put them in the sand, going around and around, and that's their fence. And then you can see guys who are repairing chariots, they're carrying water, supplies. They're doing all this. You can even see Ramsey's pet lion. Ramsey's went into battle with a pet lion. <laughs> and that must have been pretty scary if you fight, you know, Pharaoh's got a lion next to him. As they're setting up camp, Mutwallis attacks. They are unprepared. Ramsey's had no idea. No idea. Attacks. What happens? There's pandemonium in camp. Everybody's afraid. And according to the accounts that we have, Ramses almost single-handedly saves the day. Ramses tells his men, what, are you afraid? I'm here. I've got our moon behind me. We're going to do it. I will give you a quote, what Ramses says about his battle. He says, they said to his majesty, My good lord, thou art strong ruler. Thou art great savior of Egypt on the day of fighting. We stand in the midst of battle. Behold, the infantry and chariotry have deserted us. For what reason dost thou remain to rescue them? Right? They said, the men are saying, what are we going to do? We've got to run. Ramses looks at them like they're Lutz, and he says, What ails you, my high officers, my infantry, my chariotry, who know not how to fight? Does not a man magnify himself in his city when he has come and has acted as brave in the presence of his Lord? Did you not know in your hearts that I am your, your, your iron? I'm, st I'm the strong one? He says, I defeated millions of foreign countries. Right? He says, follow me. According to Ramses, he goes into battle practically by himself and pushes back Mutwallis and the enemy. And the account, as I said, you know, we even have the names of Ramses' horses, his two chariot, chariot horses, right? Victory in Thebes, right? And Mut, the, you know, one of the goddesses, is content. 
Victory in Thebes and Mood Discontent are his horses. So Ramses wins the day. Now, he pushes them back. Night falls, and it's going to be a battle the next day. Mutualis has 40,000. Ramses has 20,000. They've brought up the rear. What happens? I think all accounts is that it's a standoff. Ramses' army is better trained. Mutualis has more men. It's a standoff. The Hittites say, let's sign a peace treaty. Ramses says, no, I won't sign a treaty. It says, only a truce. Now, the difference is a truce is temporary. It says, I'm going to be back. It's a cessation of fighting, but I'll be back. A peace treaty is longer. It says, no, just a truce. And he goes back to Egypt, right? So it's a standoff, he gets this truce. He comes back to Egypt, and on every temple wall, he carves this wonderful account of the Battle of Kadesh, Ramses the hero. He will, in a sense, dine out on this story for the next 60 years. He continues to fight. He does. Eight years later, he goes back to Syria. Doesn't take Kadesh, by the way. Doesn't take that city of Kadesh. But he defeats the, you know, the Hittites, and he, he, he fights. So Ramses has very early in his career established he is a military man to be reckoned with. Now, Ramses the builder. He has completed his father's monuments, right? Remember the two? He's completed Karnak's Hyperstyle Hall and also the temple at Abydos. Now he starts building his own. And he builds one of the most incredible monuments Egypt has ever seen. He chooses a site that I think is politically smart. He builds at Abu Simbel. Now, Abu Simbel is in Nubia. It's, remember the southern border of Egypt is at Aswan. At Aswan are cataracts, boulders in the Nile, that makes navigation difficult. So it's a natural border. You know, say, well, we start at, at the first cataract. He builds south of the first cataract at Abu Simbel, and it's such a unique monument. I'm going to describe it in detail, and as I'm describing it, think about what American monument is patterned after it. What's unique about it is that it's carved into a mountain. It is carved out of a mountain. In the front of the mountain are four 67-foot-high statues of Ramses the Great, seated on his throne, four statues. Now, think about how you have to do that if you're going to carve a mountain in the shape of four statues of a pharaoh. There had to be guys hanging down on scaffolds. They put down a grid on the mountain, red grid, sort of squares. The painters come and rough in where they want the sculpting done. Then the sculptors are hanging down, and they're carving it. And they carve these 467-foot statues of Ramses the Great. An amazing thing. Nothing like it had ever been seen. Now, the temple itself is inside the mountain. Right between the two innermost statues of Ramses, you go right in, into a temple. Now, why build there? Nobody was ever there as a large population. This is in Nubia. The answer is, it's propaganda. Nubia was the, was the southern border of Egypt. South of Egypt is Nubia. This was a confederation of tribes, Nubia. It was never called Nubia, by the way, in the, by the ancient Egyptians. They called it Kush. It's Kush of the Bible. And there was another Egyptian word for it, Ta Seti, the land of the bow. These were archers, archers. So the idea is this. If the Nubians are ever going to be rambunctious and try to come north, the first thing they would see when they came north are these big statues of Ramses the Great. If they were bold enough to get off their, you know, out of their boats and go into the temple, the first thing they would see is bound Nubians. There were, there were scenes of Nubians, captives, tied. And then, if they went into the temple, whoa, they would see the Battle of Kadesh and Ramses defeating everybody. So it was propaganda. It was really clever. And it's carved out of a mountain. Now, what monument do we have that's like that? I think it's the ins inspiration for Mount Rushmore. The four presidents' heads on the mountain, I think that's where it comes from. I, I, I would bet anything that somebody saw, saw Abu Simbel and said, ah, this is a great idea. Interesting, by the way, it took about the same time to carve, about 20 years. But Mount Rushmore was made out of granite, and Abu Simbel's a lot softer. But we had jackhammers. Ramses didn't, but it's still an incredible monument. Now, Ramses distinguishes himself as a builder. But I think also important is Ramses as the family man. He has a great wife. The great wife is Nefertari. Right? It's a nice name. It means the beautiful one has come. 
And clearly, he loves Nefertari because Abu Simbel is not the only temple he builds. Not the only one he builds on that site. Right next to it to the right is a smaller temple that he builds for his wife, Nefertari. As far as I know, she is the only one to have her own temple like that. And there is a lovely, lovely inscription just to the left of the doorway. And it says, Nefertari, she for whom the sun doth shine. All right, so he really loved Nefertari. Now, Ramses has a great wife, Nefertari, and she has a son who is slated to become the king of Egypt. His name is Amun Her Kepshef. It's an interesting name, Amun Her Kepshef. Amun, you can pick up the god. A Kepshef is a curved sword, and Her means upon. Amun is upon my sword. So he too was maybe slated to be a military man. He won't become king of Egypt, though. He will die. He will die before. Ramses has many sons, though. You won't believe it when I tell you, but he had 52 sons. 52 sons, slightly more daughters. He had over 100 children, right? More than 100 children. Of course, he had more than one wife, right? He has only one great wife, probably, who is the, the, the famous Nefertari. She dies, by the way, fairly early in the reign. I think she dies around year 20. I'll tell you why I say that. Around year 20, Abu Simbel was finished. They completed the temple. And Nefertari and her husband, Ramses the Great, went down to dedicate it. And that's the last we ever hear of Nefertari. We never hear of her again. You know, the Egyptians never recorded when somebody died. They, they never made, sent out an announcement because it was a loss. It was, it was, in a sense, um, chaos triumphing over order. So we never hear, oh, the pharaoh died at this date or anything like that. She dies, she disappears from history, and that's all we hear. Now, he has another important wife, East Nofret. Another nice name, by the way. The beautiful Isis. East is Isis. Nofret, beautiful. Um, she has several children, too. And the kids of Ramses are almost as great as the father. Almost as great as the father. One of them, Chaim Waset, Chaim Waset, whose name means rising in Thebes, right? Rising or shining forth in Thebes. Cha is rising, M is in, and Waset, if you'll remember, is the ancient Egyptian name for Thebes, the capital, religious, religious capital. So Chaim Waset is one. He is the first recorded archaeologist in history. He was interested in ancient monuments. Now, ancient monuments, the pyramids, they were a thousand years old by Ramsey's time. He was afraid that people would forget who had built the pyramids. So he went around carving on them, you know. On the outside of a pyramid of Unas, he would find the pyramid of Unas and say, Unas carved this pyramid. I, Chaim Waset, am restoring it. So he was interested in archaeology. He was also a high priest of Memphis. And he builds an interesting structure called the Serapium, a place where the sacred Apis bull was buried. So Chaim Waset is quite something. But he also dies. He's not, he's not going to become the pharaoh. But we have this picture of Ramses that I think is important to gain from his early years. He is a military man. He is geared for being a military man. He does it well. He raises perhaps his sons to be military men. He is a builder. He builds not only Abu Simbel, but other great things too. He builds his own temple at Abydos. He builds his own mortuary temple where he'll be worshipped after he's dead called the Ramesseum. And there's a great statue at the Ramesseum, a fallen colossal statue of Ramses. And that's the statue that Shelley wrote the famous poem about, Ozymandias, where he talks about seeing this fallen statue of a pharaoh and how it's all pointless, it's all pride and vanity to think you're going to last forever. That's the statue of Ramses. And it's called Ozymandias because it's a Greek corruption of one of the five names of Ramses. Usumat Re became Usumandius. Right? So Ramses is a great builder, he's a great military man, and he's also a family man. He is a man who cares about his children. He records them on his temple walls all the time. But Ramses is going to have the equivalent of a midlife crisis. Something is going to happen in his middle years that will change him completely. He will no longer go out to battle. 
He will no longer build the great monuments, and we'll talk about what changes them next time. See you then.